All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Y'all give a big wave. Hey. We're live again two weeks after our, our last storytelling live stream where we all gathered and had a really, really, well, I thought it was really beautiful and meaningful time to, to talk about stories and where, yeah, how they are impacting us in our lives right now. And even in the past two weeks, so much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like it's a good opportunity to cycle back to, you know, and circle back to storytelling and what that means to us and how it can help us in our, our lives and in these times. Um, so I'm really grateful to be back here with Danny and with Chris and with Lander and with Teague. Unfortunately, Luke uh, wasn't able to join us today. He was meant to be here, but um, wasn't able to in the end. So. Luke is here with us in spirit, big shout out. And uh, hopefully if we continue doing these storytelling connections, well, when we, because I anticipate we will continue, Luke will join us in the future. Um, so I can see people have joined us now. Thank you so much for being here today and definitely leave a comment in the chat. Let us know you're here, um, say hi. <laughs> It'd be great to, to know who's watching and with us here today. Um, and I also just want to let you know a little bit about, I guess, the background behind this event. We've previously been coming together, sharing different stories from all our different places around the world and what they mean to us and reflecting on them. Today is a little different. We are obviously gonna be sharing stories because we're gonna be talking, but rather it's gonna be a conversation about us as storytellers and a, an opportunity for everybody to get to know us a little bit more um, and how we came to be storytellers, uh, our journeys, in the hopes that that may inspire you on your storytelling journey as well. So um, we are hopefully going to have the option for people to join in the conversation. You've in the past been able to comment on the live streams, and that's a wonderful way of interacting. So I highly recommend and encourage people to continue to comment um, and for us to talk to each other that way. But I'm also going to place in the comments right now a link to actually join us by video <laughs> in this live stream. So um, if at any point you have a question and you wanna ask it in a video format, we're gonna attempt to be able to bring in some people and it's only we're only gonna be able to bring in one person at a time. So you'll have to bear with us and I haven't done this before, so who knows what technology is gonna do. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna put that link in the comments right now and feel free if you do have a question that comes up as we're talking to join in. So. And I can see all these wonderful comments coming up from people who have joined us. It's so great to have you here, Kristen and Alice and the Bridge East Greenwich <laughs> or Ruth <laughs> from the Bridge Center. And Joe, I'm so glad you're here again. And Andrew and John and Libby and is it Ronnie or Roni? Um, Sean, wow. And Forever Green Forest School. This is phenomenal to have you all back here with us. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my hello. Does anyone else, any of my other wonderful storytellers want to say a hello? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Perfect. Um, all right. So I just wanted to start us off with a little bit of, a, I guess, a reflection. <laughs> I've become known for reflection. And I've personally just been reflecting on the, the past few months of life in general and also this um, these storytelling gatherings and the realization, I think what's come out for me the most is the realization of how interconnected we all are, despite the differences in our location and our life experiences and what's happening. There's so much that we have in common. And so that's just been a real highlight for me and the, the tying it, how it's all wrapped up into stories, like how these connections and interconnections can be really just wrapped up into really rich and meaningful stories, um, which brings us here today to learn a little bit more of like, okay, well, you know, as, as storytellers, how do we, where are we coming from with all this and how did we get here today? Um, and before we launch into that, I personally just want to, to take a moment to acknowledge what's happening right now across the world. Obviously we have been faced with a pandemic and that's what's brought us here in a lot of ways together. And then more recently um, in the past week, the, the turmoil and the pain and the hurt and the anger across um, the United States and more widely um, in this movement to acknowledge and demonstrate that um, to people that, that Black Lives Matter that has, it just has really impacted me in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's very much also connected with storytelling. 
um, to me. And so I want to reflect on that. I'm going to share a little bit more later on in this live stream, but I just wanted to acknowledge that first off because I think it's, it's really important to me. Um, and where I'm coming from is asking myself, what can I do? What can I do to help make this world a safer place for people? And for me, what's coming up first, and there's a long road ahead, but what's coming up first is storytelling. Um, storytelling has a role. So that's kind of my intro um, to all of this. And again, thank you all for being here. I can see a few more people showing up. I'm so glad you're here and Liz. Um, and I'm not gonna pronounce this right, but Agnieszka, <laughs> I'm so sorry if I said that wrong. Um, it's great to, to have you here with us. Thanks for commenting. So with that, um, we thought we'd start off with a, a gratitude, just a chance to go around and share what we're feeling grateful for today. You know, even through all this heaviness, where is the lightness? Where is the gratitude? Mm -hmm. So um, would someone like to start us off? <laughs> I can. I'm happy to. Thanks, Danny. So um, today I am grateful for a change in the wind. Um, the weather has been glorious and warm, and I love the warm, sunny weather. But when I woke this morning and I opened the window, there was just a new scent that just filled filled the air. Um, and it brought a real sense of calm to, to me. And I looked out at my garden, and it seemed like all the plants were really, really happy that we'd had a lot of rain last night and this morning. And um, it just gave me a moment to take a big deep breath in and be grateful for the the change up to the north wind and bringing some cooler air and some wet air as well so i'm grateful for that mm. Mm. okay i'll go next um yeah likewise i'm well i'm really grateful for two things actually what's it three but um the first one is the weather and the wetness and the grass that we've had um, not the grass. <laughs> I don't mean that, that I've been smoking loads of grass. What I mean is um, that the grass is very happy that we've had some rain and uh, I've been watering my grass um, recently because it's yeah, been really kind of parched and almost dead. So um, yeah, very grateful for a bit of rain and grateful for the abundance at this time of year, the sort of energy and uh, grateful for conversations with friends who um, you know are struggling at the moment and uh, it's just been really that, that sort of connection through, um, yeah, through these hard times and, you know, having, that we have friends and uh, they can hold us close to their hearts. It's great. Yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Pass it on. I think I would echo that as well. I was going to say I'm really grateful for, for friends right now and um, for, for friends who are willing to to come together and, and talk about things that need to be talked about and brainstorm ways to move forward to make the world a better place and just to be vulnerable together. And also grateful for the rain. Maine has also been very dry and the garden is looking much happier this morning after a night of rain. Hmm. I am very grateful for my loved ones in my life, family members, friends, and I'm very grateful for where I live here in Calgary. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to explore storytelling. It's been so great to dive into this, this medium of storytelling. And especially in preparation for today's stream, I got to revisit some of the influences in my life that I hadn't really revisited before. And that's brought some gratitude as well. And I hope to share some of those influences with, with you all. Cool, awesome. looking forward to it, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, me too. I'm, uh, I'm grateful, I'm helping out part-time on a farm this summer, an organic farm um, that's based on regenerative, regenerative and organic farming. And it's a, in a, a community that there's multiple plots and lots of different farmers doing their things. And it's a real diverse community where I'm spending days outside growing food with other just amazing people from all over the world um, and just feeling, yeah, feeling at peace, just being outside and working with the land on those days. Um, it's bringing me a lot of 
a lot of um, calm and and just gratitude, really. <laughs> um, it's great for my mental well-being, um, personal well-being. And I'm also grateful to people who, like all of you who are here today, who are willing to have conversations, to share stories, and particularly share in, in vulnerability um, and things that are hard to talk about. Um, so feeling deep, deep, deep gratitude for, for people to, who are willing to engage in conversations that might be might be hard to have. <laughs> so and I can see a few comments, grateful for family, grateful for having a beautiful wild space so close to your house, grateful for, for family, security, garden and baby plants. They give me a place to retreat away from all the sadness in the world. Yeah, we need a place to fill back up, you know, feel the sadness, feel that, mm -hmm. process it, and then also um, take care of ourselves in another space too. So gardens definitely do that for me too. Grateful for our local community and the new connections been making over the last couple of months to do with forest school inclusion and access to sports through Zoom. That's fantastic. Thank you all for sharing your, your gratitude as well. Um, so, yeah, the, I know not all of you have been with us through our storytelling live streams. It was that we did them together, but we kind of just would launch into our stories and share, um, share a little bit about, yeah, like, maybe the story and where it came from, but not so much about who we all are. And we would maybe post, yeah, we would have little things on the bottom of ways to get in touch with us, what our name was, but we never really shared much about who we are and what we do outside of these boxes <laughs> on a YouTube video. <laughs> so I wanted to just provide the chance for our, you know, these amazing storytellers to share a little bit about uh, yourself and your work um, and anything maybe that's exciting that's coming up that you, that other people could get involved in or know more about. So, does anyone want to start us off? Tell us a little more about yourself. Oh. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'll go first then. So nobody else is, I'll fill the space. Um, so, how long have we got, Kay Kaylin? I'll try and time myself. <laughs> Just, uh, how long I mean, tell your, tell your story, but yeah. Yeah. Sure okay. Other things too. Um, so, I first started getting into storytelling at a festival in Sussex. I've been playing music in a small band. We were called Jabberwocky, and uh, I played didgeridoo and percussion. And uh, it was after one of our gigs um, that I went into a chai tent, and there was a fire going on. Um, and I sat down, ran the fire, got myself a big mug of chai. And um, in those days, I used to smoke rollies. So I just was sat, sat there on my own, just rolling up a cigarette, enjoying the fire in the center of this kind of um, tent. And uh, a guy sort of said, do you mind if I tell a story? And there was about 15 other people in the, in the tent as well. Um, I was like, great, go on then. So he told us this story. And he said he'd, he'd just come back from Palestine where he'd been working and he'd told this story that was so funny but it was the message of the story which was called the land is not yours to own was that um well that the land isn't ours to own and there's all these people around the place fighting over over land and that seemed to be such a common conflict around the world um but the you know the message is that you know, we're pretty much here to look after the place or, or at least be part of that you know, in sort of stewardship of the land and not um, in control of it. And I just thought the message of this story that he just dropped in there like a beautiful little rose was was awesome. And I was at the time I was like two or three years out of an environmental science degree where I'd sort of gone into it um, wondering what else, you know, what can I do in this world that can be you know, contributing towards a, a better future of some sort. I think I need to know more about how the world works. And then I'd come out of it uh, thinking, well, maybe I should be a teacher. Maybe I, I'm, you know, I, I still want to learn about permaculture and about looking after myself. So I sort of, I'd learnt you know, about herbs and plants and wild food. I was doing that for a couple of years and began growing some of my own food and about permaculture design. But I still didn't really know much about how to talk about environmentalism um, because it was all a bit heady and a bit sort of academic and this guy had just 
dropped in this story that had had all of us in the, that tent kind of on the edge of our sort of seat and laughing and almost crying as well. Um, and I just thought, wow, I want to be like that person. In, I'm just telling a story and it has so many layers of meaning to it. Um, and so after the next couple of years, I, I went, I found myself going to some Druid camps. Um, I wasn't actually a Druid, but one of the, my friends was uh, bringing a sweat lodge or a sort of sauna to the uh, Druid camps. And I sort of, I was there sort of helping him with the wood and setting up the, the space. And um, at these camps round the night, at, at night, round the fire, people would be telling stories. They, you know, harp or there would be instruments. And I was like, wow, music and stories goes together. And uh, after, my, in the second year of helping out these camps, as a didgeridoo player, I've been playing didgeridoo and percussion, but um, I thought, well, oh, maybe I could tell a story that had didgeridoo in it. And then, um, because I'd heard a story in Australia about how the Milky Way came to be after one of the first didgeridoos or the pieces of wood was played like a didgeridoo. And uh, so I sort of added to the story and um, thought, well, maybe I'll um, be able to tell that story around, around one of the campfires and eventually plucked up my courage to tell the story around the campfire. And uh, it was just such a lovely space to um, to have my first go at being a storyteller and I used the crutch of having a didgeridoo there to sort of help me be this storyteller um, and then the feedback was great people enjoyed it and I thought oh I can do this um, and then slowly working on um, on various sort of summer camps um, that I used to run with a company called Wildwise where I was teaching bushcraft and sort of primitive living, forest school skills, outdoor play, lots of out outdoor play, ecological awareness games and stuff. Um, one of the guys that led those camps, he was a more accomplished storyteller. He worked in the theater before um, and he told quite a few stories. So I started picking up tips and tricks from him and um, started telling stories myself and yeah, slowly but surely, I got into this narrative led learning and the idea that you can just tell a story, a short, simple one, doesn't have to be very long, but within that story, there's so much juice and that um, different people take different messages from each story. And um, I don't have to tell people how to be environmental because I don't want to push it down people's throat. It's like, here's a story, take what you want from it. And, um, that's that's kind of why I got into storytelling so much, and uh, now that's what I that's what I do a lot of now. And amazingly, the um, the storytelling course that I've put together, which is um, at natureconnection.co.uk, which is a sort of it's an online storytelling course to give people uh, the courage to tell stories, um, uh, and it's a starter for a twelve month storytelling course. You know, that's the starter course has had over 3,000 people sort of, you know, try it out and I've got great feedback from it. So it's been really nice to have that, um, people take on that course. But for me, what it's about is it's about empowering lots of other people to be able to feel confident to tell stories and to help the people that listen to the stories connect with nature, um, you know, both internal nature and external nature. Mm -hmm. through the power of stories that's so that's that's kind of how i've got to be here and then people like kaylin uh, know about me from what i do in, in the forest school world i suppose um and i, I wrote a book somewhere along the line as well <laughs> which, <laughs> which helps yeah um which is which is again this is story-led activities and stuff so i think that's me any Reflections, questions. Great wow. recap, Chris. Love that Thanks. story. Yeah. I love the idea of you sat in a chai tent. Yeah. Like a mug of chai. I wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could grow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. What about, 
what about you guys? I'd love to hear too, because that's what I'm here for t this afternoon is is about hearing um, your stories and how you got to become or feel like your storytellers. Mm. Yeah, I'm happy to share if that's okay. Yeah. 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 Um, some similar themes, Chris, with, with what you just spoke about then, but I guess my introduction to storytelling um, or to becoming a storyteller is a little bit different, where I think I first recognised the potential for storytelling when I worked at a Centre for Experiential Learning in New Hampshire. Um, and I went there as a 20-year-old who was just open to whatever the world was going to give me. And um, I, I mean, I've described it myself as a transformational experience of my own. And I know that the story was central to that experience. And whilst I was there in my first, um, my first year, I had met three storytellers. I met a lot of storytellers, but three in particular that, that stuck with me. One was called Odds Bobkin. If any of you've heard oh, of him. Love him. But, um, yeah. He was really the first storyteller that I ever listened to, and I was just mesmerised by his stories. Um, but I always saw his stories as a form of entertainment, which was great, and I loved that. Um, and then um, a good friend of mine called Lachlan Danzi was also an amazing storyteller, but I found that a lot of his stories were value-based stories and helped me really try and get a deeper understanding of my own value system and what was important to me in the world. And the third storyteller who made an impact on me was a, um, an experiential educator called Woody Belt. And he used to pull all of his um, community building <laughs> experiential education activities together with metaphorical stories and everybody's Brilliant. learning and personal development on a individual level but on a community level as well were woven together through through story and bringing meaning out of out of the activities through through the storytelling and this experience just blew me away and i knew after that year that i wanted to be a storyteller but i wasn't sure how or what i wanted what i wanted to tell stories about um but I'd always had this, this deep kind of connection with nature and wanting to teach people about the environment as well. And I remember the first story that I ever told, I was so terrified to tell the story. It was one, I've told it on the live stream, the one about the six sons. And I was so afraid that I got a group of people to come up with me and ask them to reenact the story behind me as I told it, because I just didn't want to be on my own up there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I then became a storyteller and tried to use story in the same ways that that it, I'd seen, like these value-based stories, these um, experiential learning stories and stories for entertainment. Um, but it wasn't until really I became a forest school leader and I came back to the UK where I really started to practice using stories more and more and more. And one of the reasons for that was because of working with children who I would say were um, play deprived and who I would say off you go and play and they would run and climb a tree and make a mud pie and go on the tree swing and come back and say I've done everything I'm bored there's nothing to do here in the forest so I then tried to, to use story as a way to re-engage them with play um and to re-engage them with the environment and similar to you chris i've always struggled with this idea about environmental activism and how i can get that message across without it sounding preachy or mm. without it putting people off um and story was a great way that i was able to get that balance right so reconnecting children with their play using story as a bridge between um, nature and their play, but um, yeah, also using it to share some of my own values as well. Um, and I don't think I ever became a storyteller. I don't know, I remember I did a, a, um, a workshop at the Forest School Association 
uh, conference a few years back. And I remember driving home from that thinking, God, I'm a storyteller now because I just did a workshop on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it just kind of dawned on me. But in terms of what I'm doing now, that's so why I have a project called uh, Community, which is an outdoor education project. I've also recently started a new project called We Be Kids, which is the We Being We Be Kids stands for well-being. And it's a way of linking yoga and nature and storytelling to family well-being and trying to give people resources for that. Um, and another project, which I don't talk much about, but is also linked with storytelling as well that I do, is called Good Souls, which is a men's group which I founded. Um, and, yeah, it's a men's support group to help with mental health, and we do a lot of storytelling in that as well. Oh, good on you. So do, you my... mention, do you want to mention your book too, Danny? Oh, yes, of course. And um, I wrote a book called The Happiness Tree. So when I started telling stories in the woods, um, I found it really difficult to find stories that matched the message that I wanted to, to share with the children and to share with the world. So I just started writing my own stories. Um, and one of those stories is the happiness tree. I've wrote a lot of stories, but I had 12 stories that were, were gonna be published. And one of them was the happiness tree. That one is published. My, uh, Yeah, that one was published. You can buy it, contact me if you'd like a copy. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a story writer as well as a storyteller, I guess. Awesome, thank you, Danny. You can welcome. relate to a lot. I can relate to a lot of what you both have said. Um, Teague, Orlando, would you like to share a little bit more about your journey and self? Sure, I'd uh, share about myself a little bit. I definitely have never thought of myself as a storyteller until this opportunity, essentially, when I saw that Kaylin had posted through Force School on Facebook about storytelling and I tuned in for the first one and then watched the second one on YouTube. And I thought, I'd like to do that. <laughs> I'd like to try that out. And I started like adapting stories that Danny and Chris told and stories that Kaylin told. And I just wrote them out in my own words, essentially. And I started creating a storybook, a song book and storybook. It has songs I've written, songs I haven't written stories I've written, stories I haven't written, stories I've adapted. And I realized, okay, this is this is something I'm interested in. Now I want to actually try and be in front of people and do this. And what a great opportunity that I have here during the pandemic is to reach out and do it online. And so, yeah, I reached out to Kaylin and she reached out to me. I can't remember which way it was, but one of us reached out to a community or something or other and then I and then I started doing some storytelling and that was that's when I actually thought I was okay I want to be a storyteller that being said I think every one of us is a storyteller since the the moment that we can begin to form thoughts in our minds we begin to craft stories about the world around us and these stories are extremely powerful and one thing I've learned recently from Darren Brown, who's a mentalist slash illusionist guy out of the, the UK, actually. He he has a quote and he he says, I'm just going to read it right off of his, his website here. We are, each of us, a product of the stories we tell ourselves. Yeah. And that goes back to what I was saying about the power of story is that when we have these episodes in our lives in the past, we may think them as negative episodes or positive episodes or whatnot. It's all about how you think about those incidences, how you shape those stories. Mm -hmm. And that can really impact your, your future. If you think of these things as more of learning opportunities that have shaped you into the person you are today and, and can be built upon, they can really be stepping stones for you becoming a better person. If you dwell on them as failures and disappointments, then you, your story that you keep telling yourself is, oh, I'm a disappointment, I'm a failure. 
So the stories are extremely, extremely powerful. And that's, I think, why they link so well to humans and human culture, how they've always been told oral storytelling, stelling, or, oral storytelling, written storytelling. It's all been passed down throughout the generations of, uh, of us. Mm -hmm. It's extremely powerful. And I wanted to give a, a little shout out, essentially, to the stories that made me. Uh, and maybe when I tell these uh, these stories that impacted me, the people who are watching or the people I'm speaking with here on the live stream can reflect on some of the stories that impacted you. Maybe pull out some old books, think back on some memories and think how those shaped you into the person you are today. So one of the big ones I would say is my mom and dad. When I was a young young child, they would tell me stories before bedtime, they would read to me out of books. And my, my mom and dad have always been storytellers in fictional stories, but also in uh, non-fictional stories about their lives and teaching me as I grew up. So thanks, thanks to them. <laughs> and they've always encouraged a great love of reading in me. And one of the first series of books that I actually picked up from chapters or one of the bookstores was this one here. The, the crystal shard is what it's called. You might not be able to see it with the glare. Uh, but I'll just tell you the name of it. It's, it's by R.A. Salvatore. It's a fantasy novel. That's what really got me into fantasy. And that had a series of books, like seven books that I read. And I was like, whoa, this whole other world where these creatures live is now in my mind and my imagination. It's amazing that I could see myself in this world, but also see myself interacting in this fantasy world. And uh, then I went on and started delving into more interesting fantasy stuff. And I only recently picked this up, but I've been a fan of Brian Froud and the Froud family for a long time. And they do a lot of work on fairies and fairy lore. This is their book. This is uh, Brian and Alan Lee's book, Fairies. Amazing, amazing book that has lots of lore and legends about fairies that I recommend to anyone who's interested in magical beings. Mm -hmm. So I'd say my early years were definitely shaped by fantasy and fiction. And, and only recently have I been delving into some of the stories, the nonfiction books, the prose, the poems of people who live in the modern world or in uh, the non-modern were in the historical ancestral kind of worlds uh, where people wrote poems and that's been really inspiring as well. I've been just recently picked up Mark Marcus Aurelius's Meditations and I hope to, I haven't read it yet soon, but I'm curious about that. It's just his writings on the times back when he was alive. I would also like to acknowledge four school practitioner course because when I took the four school practitioner course I was introduced to Kaylin because she's actually written a few of her reflections and stories in the practitioner course handbook and there's lots of other people who shared stories in there and one of the central or core parts of this practitioner course is learning about storytelling and becoming a storyteller and a part of the course we had an indigenous elder of the area around Calgary here come and tell stories to us practitioners. And I was like, whoa, once again, I really want to do something like that. And then I'd say the next step I had in the process of becoming what I now would say I want to be a storyteller and in any aspect I can is I started getting into collective storytelling through Dungeons and Dragons if people have heard of Dungeons and Dragons through popular media, etc., Stranger Things, it was featured quite heavily on. That kind of inspired me as well as some of my friends were playing. And it's an amazing way to do uh, what I would call improv storytelling, improv collective storytelling, where there's people that are crafting a world and a story together. And then when you reflect on that with those people you played with, you don't really say, oh, my character did this, my character did that. It's more of like, remember when we fought that ogre on the bridge? That was so cool. 
it's like you were actually that person. That's what I really love about it is you have this collective memory through the story that you told together. And it's something that really bonds you and builds a relationship. And through Dungeons and Dragons, I realized that storytelling is a great way to form relationships. And then I was like, oh, that makes sense why it was in the four school practitioners course. And I didn't realize it until you uh, both Danny and Chris mentioned it is it's a great way to to talk about the environment and to share our connection with the environment without sounding like kind of you're just dictating facts to people is you just share this beautiful story and then they can take what what they will take what they may and some of it may impact them to go on and become stewards and some of it may not and they might just go a totally different direction with the story but it's all about just telling the story and and letting it land and then hearing other people's stories i think so that's uh, that's my storytelling story I hope to continue being a storyteller as I go forward. I've got plans in motion to maybe start a small business and so something like that. We'll see if that comes to fruition. I'd like to get out to, I was going to do festivals and stuff this summer and maybe do some storytelling, but now that they're, a lot of them are canceled because of the pandemic, might do some more online storytelling to build up my repertoire. So thank you again, Kaylin. Thank you everyone here that says, uh, been a stepping stone for me. Thank you, Teague. I really, I love learning more about the, the background behind that because I know that our our stories have merged through this live stream. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we didn't know each other before this. And I have a lot of admiration for you being our first guest. Like I was putting it out there to people, anybody want to be a guest storyteller? Really trying to to provide space for people who are who are wanting to. And uh, a lot of people were nervous and saying like, no, oh, because it's scary. It's scary to put your face on YouTube and, and tell a story, especially if you're not used to it. And uh, you were the first. So yeah, thank you for being a part of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm eager to hear Lander's story next, but I also just wanna say to everyone who's watching, if you have questions for, you know, in general, all of us or for some mm. of us, particular feel free to type it in the question box and I also am inviting you to join our live stream if you're a brave soul <laughs> that wants to try asking us a question by video there's a, a link um, that I put in the comments to that you're you're welcome to, to come in and I'll you'll be you'll be put in a waiting room and then I'll bring you in um, but we can try that um, you have to provide your own tea though when you're in your waiting room <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. Oh, I, I wanted to mention a couple names. I forgot I wrote them down, actually. So do you mind if I just quickly mention these people that influenced me as a storyteller? Please. Okay. So many of you, the Canadians, might have heard of Stuart McLean and the Vinyl Cafe. He recently passed away. And uh, my family and I would listen to his stories on CBC Radio, the Canadian broadcast company that goes throughout the nation. And his stories really, really, really impacted me. And I just wanted to say thank you, Stuart, and thank you to the people who put on Vinyl Cafe for me when I was when I was a younger lad. It's it's emotional because he is gone and those stories are still with me and luckily they're still accessible through the internet as well as CDs that my family has collected. So uh, yeah, thank you, Stuart, and that the companies that help produce the vinyl cafe and then the people one of the first people who got me into dungeons and dragons is a an online personality a voice actor matthew mercer he helps put on critical role the dungeons and dragons group and his storytelling the way he tells a story and weaves the players through his his world that he created is uh, an inspiring thing for me to create worlds and write stories. So thank you, Matthew Mercer as well. It's great to hear about your influences, Teague. Thank you for sharing. And I know there are people that are asking about some of the resources and providing specific links. And Chris, someone's asking about a link to your book and same with you, Danny. And um, I wasn't sure on specific links. So if you have those to share and if you can't put them in the actual chat, just send it in our little private chat. I'll, I'll enter it. <laughs> um, so yeah. It'd be great to share direct links with any of these if we do have them. Um, Lander, would you like to, to share a little bit about you and your journey to storytelling? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. So um, for, for those of you who don't know, I live in Maine and I work for a community conservation trust currently where I'm the outreach coordinator. We um, host school programs that are um, nature immersion based and we do a lot of community events outdoors for people of all ages. And so I've had a chance to, um, to tell stories in those settings um, as well as on this live stream. Kaylin, thank you for inviting me to the past few sessions. Um, but when I, when I think about storytelling, I feel like I, um, similar to Teague, I, I go kind of way back to my childhood and I think that's where, really where it started. And um, when I think about where I told my first story, I think that it was in the imaginary play that I um, partook in as a child. And um, that's really where I think that first act of, of storytelling really happened with my friends and my siblings outside playing in the woods and creating these stories that we were kind of living and, and moving with through the landscape. Um, so I think that's probably like my first like way of telling stories um, that I didn't really realize at the time, but reflecting on it seems, seems right. Um, and I think I had a lot of influences as well in my storytelling that I really, I wanted to mention. Um, my, my mom as well, she would tell us bedtime stories. Um, and that we, we had a, a kind of a sur surrogate grandmother down the street who told us stories about her childhood, a lot of personal stories. Um, and then I had three great aunts who also lived down the road from us. And um, so I had these kind of like older women, my mom wasn't necessarily older, but my surrogate grandmother and these three great aunts, and they love telling stories so much. And I, I grew up without um, other devices in the house, maybe telling us stories like um, the computer or the TV. And as a child, I just craved their stories and would literally go down the road to visit them for a story. That was like very intentional and a reason that, that me and my sisters would go. Um, and I wanted to give a little shout out to my three great aunts, um, two of which have passed on at this point. Um, they were they were very unique people. They were sisters, but very unique in their storytelling styles and um, kind of how they did it. My aunt Ruth um, would always tell her stories with a side of Oreo cookies and soda, which we loved mm -hmm. as kids. Um, and she would start laughing so hard when she was telling a joke in her stories or an old funny story from her childhood that sometimes she couldn't finish the stories. And we would just be hanging on to our seats, wanting her to get through um, to the last part. And then my great aunt Joy, um, she wrote children's books and played the guitar. And so her stories always had some sort of little song or music component. And they were often very imaginary. Um, she would take us to these fairy worlds that she created. And then my great aunt Hazy, she would often tell her stories with an experience. So we would go blueberry picking with her and she'd be telling us a story while we were picking blueberries or we'd go swimming with her and she'd be telling us a story. So I feel so grateful to all of these older women in my life who who shared their stories with me. And I was reflecting the other day on how a lot of the stories that I tell now with groups of kids and that I've kind of made up often have kind of a, a wise woman archetype in them, whether it's the full moon or a bat or an owl. Um, and I feel like in some ways it's these, these women in my life who kind of shared their stories with me first that are kind of coming back either in spirit or as inspiration. So I'm very, very grateful to them for, um, for their stories. Um, and I think, what else? What do you do now, Lanzer? And how are you using storytelling in your work? Yeah, so I, well, I'm, I'm, I help facilitate the nature immersion groups with schools. And um, that has been a real, a really wonderful place to share stories with children. And I think, in, one of the reasons I got into storytelling in the in the traditional sense, um, not just playing games as kids or, or listening to stories myself, but telling stories was the response that I would get from from groups of children, whether it was at a summer camp that I had worked at previously or now in my work, um, that it just it kind of stories seem to like settle in our bones, in our hearts in a way that maybe other random information doesn't so much. and. I, I just have noticed with these groups of kids in particular, um, with these, these public schools that I work at, that it stirs 
a certain amount of emotion in them that I think helps them connect with the message in the story or the bits of knowledge being imparted in the story in a in a really deep way that then seems to like spur them on to some sort of action um, or little micro change in their day or just kind of shifts like the mood and um, the, the flow of the day. And so I think that it's been a really powerful teaching and learning tool and also um, community building tool as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lander. Yeah. Yeah, really nice. Good. Community yeah. building tool. Definitely. It is. One of the, um, uh, I can't remember the, the lady, the ladies, the Scottish traveller was saying that one of the quick, shortest ways to, um, between, or the shortest distances between two people is through a story. Mm -hmm. um, and see, yeah, I, lo I love that quote. And what you, just what you've been saying is kind of like a perfect, playful, um child's you know multicultural um multi-age range uh, example of that yeah awesome yeah that's really cool well we've got lots of questions rolling in um and i also do want to to share my story of how i've be become or what i say is acknowledged myself as a storyteller <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm going to just throw out some of these questions and see if any land with any of our panelists here. Um, what are some characteristics that stand out to all of you of storytellers you admire or ways that you want to be in your own life? Um, I feel like we've touched on some of that a little bit, but if anything else is, is coming out for you that you want to share. Um, also, Chris, Forever Green Forest School is wondering where to get the mouth harp. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a link to share. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I'd say it. just to comment on the aspect of storytellers, I qualities about storytellers I really enjoy mm -hmm. is they're they're not they don't have a hesitation to pause in their story and just let that silence permeate. Mm -hmm and then continue with the story. I really love that because it kind of draws you in. Oh. I also really enjoy tone of voice and being able to manipulate one's voice to create sound effects. As you've heard, I've done, I've been influenced by people I've heard to create sound effects and different voices. I really enjoy that as it helps me get into character of the characters in the story as well as I feel like when I'm hearing stories from people who are creating different characters, they seem more alive when they're manipulating their body and moving in certain different ways and making but drumming noises if there was a drum in the story, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, one thing that when we do our storytelling training, one of the little key bits of, of um, takeaways we say is always think about tone and pace and pause as a storyteller as three tools for engaging and captivating you know they're really really important three little things to focus on because they're just like t like you just said then they can you know they can they can change the whole feel of a story by speeding up in some places and leaving a pause and different tone and if it's just monotone and it's all at the same pace and it's all at the same tone, people get they get lost in the in that. They want to. I find that it's it's more engaging that way. So, yeah, that's great. Mm. Um, we uh, doesn't do other people have more to add before I move us on. I have another. I think, little, yeah, I have a little something, but after you, Danny. Um, one thing that I try to do that I always. Um, I like in other storytellers as well, and I've seen you do this too, Chris, is um, kind of set the scene and bring the the listener into the environment, so kind of paint a picture for them in a way. And then at the end, what I always like to do is to give the listener ownership over the story as well. Mm. So invite them to either finish the story or take them on a quest or, um, yeah, it's like make them give them a gateway into becoming part of the story so that it doesn't just end there that they can take it and become part of it as well mm. 
Yeah, that's such a nice invitation, isn't it? Is to, and that's how the stories, you know, carry on, and uh, it needs to sort of get into people's hearts and, mm. and minds and bodies. And if they, if there's an invitation to be included in the story, either through participate participation or through imagining how things might end up. Yeah, yeah. I I remember one of the first times somebody did that in the middle of a story. It's like, well, what do you think? I was like, oh. I haven't been thinking at all. I've just been listening to the story. <laughs> it's like, oh no, yeah. I've got to think now. And yeah, and we stopped the conversation, the story, and had a conversation around the fire for like it went on and on and on. It's like, right, let's get back to the story. And it's like, oh, fantastic! And it was like it was this gem of of connection that happened mm. in the middle of the story. And um, yeah, what a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, mm. yeah, it's good. I guess I have something to add um, yeah. to, to that question, Kaylin. Something that I love that storytellers, I've noticed some storytellers do, and I've tried to do myself, is um, noticing where where the audience is at. And I'm thinking right now of a, a group of children. And if you've had a chance to be with them before the story gets started or um, or the, like the day before, or a few hours before, or the minute before, and incorporating something that is like really relevant in their lives, something that's happened. Like I've seen it happen with um, children, with kindergartners. They one of them loses a tooth, and then that the storyteller is able to gather their wits about them and include that big event for that child within mm -hmm. the story they were planning to tell, and just being super flexible about yeah. it. Um, and also to like making the stories flexible to the weather and to the bird that might land on the stump while the story is being told and um, to allow them that bird or that, that wind coming through to, to be a part of the story, even though you hadn't planned that. Um, yeah. So I, I like that aspect a lot of story to flexible storytelling. Yeah, me too. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Cool. Well, there's a few more more questions that are coming up, and I they actually lead into my story to becoming a storyteller. So if it's okay with you all, maybe I'll just frame the questions and then launch into my story. <laughs> yeah, um, someone's asking about you know be, feeling new to storytelling in in their role as an environmental educator and wondering where to start and how to put something meaningful together. Um, and I'm just reflecting on I feel like in each of our stories to a certain degree we've had a, someone modeling for us um, as our inspiration, and that certainly has happened with me. Um, and that really started, I think with my father, my father is a storyteller. He doesn't necessarily call himself that, but it is what he he does. And he can captivate an entire audience. Um, I have a recording of him actually giving a speech at my wedding and it, I'm gonna treasure that recording for the rest of my life because it was just the most incredible storytelling. Um, and he's been like that throughout my, my life, um, not just reading books, but in just the imagination and, and creating stories. And he did it in his work as well because he, um, he gave tours of the Hawaiian islands. And so he would talk about the, the history and you know, the stories of the land um, to his tour group. So he was very well practiced at it. <laughs> I'm trying to get him to come on to one of these live streams. <laughs> so maybe we get a group of us. Maybe my dad can come into your life. We'll see. That'll push him over the edge a little bit, but we'll see. Um, but I also was inspired by both Chris and by Danny. Uh, I don't know how much they know this. I've mentioned it, but uh, while I was living in the UK, I came across your work probably because of our, you know, circles with environmental education and forest school and everything. And I, um, just knew that you both did storytelling, Chris. I knew about your courses uh, and your your resources. I bought your book, <laughs> and uh, I was really inspired by it. But way too nervous to do it myself. I um, I did not speak in front of groups. I was not somebody who liked to stand in front of a crowd of people and speak. I didn't do public speaking. What I'm doing today, you from if you knew me ten years ago, you would never have thought that I would be doing this. Um, and <laughs> there was one day I was working at a summer camp where at the end of each week they uh, would have a storyteller, a professional storyteller come in and finish off the week with it. the children and the families would join and it would just be a way to round off the week together. And there was one week where the storyteller didn't show up and we, were, we had 60 people waiting for the storyteller. It was this anticipation. It was the lovely way to finish the week and everyone's just sitting there and nothing's happening. And I was also one of the oldest staff members. Um, a lot of the staff members were younger than me. And so I felt this sort of like, I guess, motherly role of like, I need to take care of this because I'm the elder. In this situation. 
And I had recalled just a simple story that I had heard um, told at a forest school session when I lived in the UK. I'd already moved to New Hampshire at this point, so I was across the world. But it was this little story kind of in the back of my mind of like, this still applies here. I think this could work. And it's really simple. I sort of remember the details. Maybe I could tell it. Um, and I heard myself say, I'll tell a story. <laughs> like, you know, I'll come in and, and help the situation. And then, and then immediately be like, no, <laughs> why did I do that? But I'd already committed. And so I did. I stood up in front of the group of people. I told this story. I sort of stumbled through it. it I mean, it passed the time and um, it had a storyline. <laughs> I definitely was nervous. Um, and yeah, it was not my best, my best storytelling, but it was my first. And I learned a lot from it. Um, and that was my introduction to like, okay, I tried it and it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Um, and I was a little bit embarrassed and it wasn't perfect at all. Um, but it stalled with just enough time for the actual, you know, the storyteller to show up and then they took the stage and everything was fine. So I sort of created that little, that little um, bridge. <laughs> and then since then, um, I was leading sessions, you know, for school inspired sessions with, with kids and really, was sometimes working with challenging behaviors or you know challenge things that were challenging me and wondering how can i handle this in a better way so i'm not having to like dominate the group or you know be an authority figure and i just thought stories stories t tell stories <laughs> mm -hmm. i know that they are powerful and so um and this answers john's question john was asking about how we prepare ourselves to step into the space to to tell a story and what I realized and actually only have reflected on this week that it's kind of clicked together is I couldn't tell stories that other people had written because I can't, I actually have trouble um, speaking when it's coming from a headspace. If I'm just thinking about things that I need to remember or like all these facts or details, my head can't remember it all and then I can't speak, um, which I think is why I had issues with public speaking in the past <laughs> or standing up in front of a, a crowd because I couldn't remember everything and it was too overwhelming. But I found when I told stories from my heart, <laughs> from you know my own um, self, then I, I could and I could speak and it would, it would come out. Um, and I think, yeah, that's why I decided to just write my own stories and start sharing them that way. And that's what I've continued to do. <laughs> and I'm still practicing um, today. So, and uh, yeah, I always say we are all storytellers because I think the more and more I've dived into storytelling as a practice, the more and more I've come to realize that everything, everything we do is stories. <laughs> everything is a story. Um, and yeah, I just feel like it's more of an acknowledgement of being a storyteller and, and stepping into the shoes that you may already be wearing, but just not realizing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, and yeah, what I'm doing now, I started actually forest schooled while I was um, doing forest school training when I lived in the UK and running sessions. And it forest schooled started off as a blog, which is storytelling <laughs> in written form. Um, where I would share what I was learning through my qualification with what I was doing out in the world. And Forest School has grown since then. And I've now just in this past year really invested my energy into building it as a platform to enable other educators to um, deliver programs in the outdoors with children. You know, whatever model that is, it doesn't have to be Forest School. It can be, it can be whatever works for wherever you are. But um, assisting and enabling educators to be able to do this work, um, which I know is powerful work uh, because there are a lot of barriers that we face and it can be really discouraging. So Forest School is now in, a, I'm working to make it into a place where I can support people to, to get out and do it, you know, even if it's hard so that we can, we can make positive change. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Yay. that's so cool. <laughs> so, um, we're coming up to our hour, but I wonder, well, we will run a little over, so I hope people can just carry on with us for a little bit longer. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Luke, who couldn't be here today. Um, oh, I never put my banner up. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, Luke, I'm just going to put a banner up to, to show. Luke was with us at the last storytelling live stream and was meant to be here today, but couldn't. And Luke runs Project Rewild. Um, and Project Rewild is based in Hastings in the UK, and it makes outdoor activities and play accessible to more people to get more people outside. Um, and create spaces where children and parents can be a bit more wild. So less structure, fewer rules, and more fun. And they run uh, groups and courses and community events. So I highly recommend, please do check out Luke's page uh, and see what they're doing at, at Project Rewild. And uh, yeah, Sadie couldn't be here today, but we hope to, to gather us all together in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so because, yeah, we've come up to our hour, I wonder if any of you have any thoughts before we wrap up? Um, what do I say? I, mean, I, I want to share, there's often a theme, I think, with, with people in the comments about having the courage to be a storyteller. And um, I think it's, the, it's, for me, sometimes, I can always speak for myself, but the fear is often something that can hold me back from telling a story, but also give me all of the strength that I need to tell it as well. And mm -hmm. a bit like what Teague said earlier, you know, there's always two sides to 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 any story in a way. And that fear can can make you remain seated and keep your story within you or it can in, inspire you to get up. And one thing which I often and this links in Kaylin to what you were saying then, um that inspires me to get up and tell stories is this idea that the stories that we tell for me, are the, it's the way that we paint the world. And there are so many stories out there. And, you know, the, the, like the consumer society has, knows how powerful stories are as well. And they're trying to paint stories. And, and we're all susceptible to receiving these stories and our worlds being painted for us and I think that our stories are ways that we want the world to be and I know that we're all nature storytellers and we all believe in a um, in in a world where we respect and connect with nature and want to um, support nature and rec help people recognize their their deeper connections with it so for me, that's what gets me off my seat and to tell the story because that is the world that I want to paint for people and that is the connections that I want them to make rather than feeling like they have to wear a certain set of shoes or a certain body to fit into a world. So that's mm. my motivation. Yeah. Mm. Well yeah. said. Mm. Yeah, well said, Danny. Definitely. You know, that's, you know, what the stories that I tell are there to hopefully bring a bit of hope and a bit of connection and um, uh, kind of respect for all all races, all all nations, all sort of all different parts of this family that we you know, share the earth with. And uh, that so many of the stories that I listened to as a kid, I think, um, and I grew up within school, I, you know, those weren't a complete picture. And it was, you know, it's a real surprise in my sort of early 20s to, to hear all these different stories, you know, from different cultures and, and, and um, different ways of thinking and spiritualities and all that kind of stuff that they need to be shared so that we have a bigger, bigger picture. And I think, um, I, I wanted to hear more from you, Caden, really, about you know, your reflections about you know, how storytelling can help us at the moment, especially with this kind of uh, the racial intolerance that seems to happen around the world. And, um, you know, uh, like the one of the, I'd like to share a very brief story about that, if, if I can, um, it should be a couple of minutes, but it was, it was one of the first times I ever played didgeridoo on the street um, as a as a busker and I was living in a town called Cheltenham in England and I'd taken my didgeridoo um, I've got a drum to sit on I've got my sort of a little kind of comfy carpet to sit on or a prayer prayer mat actually um, and I was just starting to play and, and this guy in very dark skin in a suit started walking down the street towards me and I, I noticed him but I carried on playing him but he he stopped right by me and he said um, I stopped playing and he said, uh, hey, mate, where's your ochre? And I was like, 
uh, what? what? What do you mean? So I said, pardon? And he said, where's your ochre? And I was like, uh, he needs to know where the yoga class is. Uh, <laughs> you know, what, what's he doing? And uh, so I said, sorry, I, I don't understand. He said, you know, your paint. Where's your paint? You should be wearing some ochre. I was like, oh my goodness, this guy's got an Australian accent. He's an Aboriginal man. He's in a suit. And he's telling me I should be putting some paint on my face. And I said, um, because I'm playing my didgeridoo. And I just thought, wow, I'm not acknowledging the, the spirit of where this has come from or, or something. But I said to him, you know, I, I, I'm a white fellow. Is that okay for me to wear paint? And he said, yeah, mate. Yeah, you sh um, we're all the same color under the skin, aren't we? And you should be wearing some of that paint to remind remind us, um, all the people who are listening, that uh, we're all part of the earth. And uh, so put some on next time you're performing, eh? And he walked on. And it's like, okay, how weird that this guy should, and wonderful. And mm. you know, so that's my little story that I sort of tell about, you know, we're all the same color under the skin. Aren't we? And mm. thank you to that guy for you know, bothering yeah. to, to stop and share that little bit of wisdom with me. Yeah, well, I would love to just finish us off with a, a little personal story of why why I, I know that storytelling is really important for those reasons um, for bringing us together as a, you know, common humanity. Um, does that feel okay with, I know, Teague Lander, did you have anything else to add before I go into that? Go for it. Um, okay, so I wanted to share my screen because I wanted to share this story with an image. <laughs> so, um, see how this works. So this, hey. is, <laughs> this is me on the left, and this is my sister. Um, we grew up together. She is eight months older than me, so my mother called us twins. We used to dress alike. <laughs> um, and we lived in a, my childhood, I grew up in Hawaii, and we lived in a close-knit type community, diverse community, um, went to a, a small school where my mother was a teacher. And so growing up as a, as a child, I was insulated within this community that had just accepted my family for who we were. And there was no question about whether we were sisters or not. There just, it, we knew that we looked different. That was obviously apparent. Um, but there was just no question that we were siblings and that we were sisters. And then when I was 11 years old, we had um, some new people that came to our school, two um, boys about the same age as, as me. And when I mentioned that's my sister um, in sort of introductions, they laughed. And then they started making jokes that, oh, ha, ha, well, we're brothers. And I felt so deeply confused about why that was a joke to them. And it dawned on me for the first time in my young life as I was developing that I couldn't take it for granted that people would understand that we were sisters um, because of the way that we looked. And it just highlighted to me I was told a story my whole life <laughs> that this was my sister. And that was the story that I knew. We were a family. And it wasn't until somebody else challenged that story <laughs> that um, I started to understand and think differently, or at least know that other people felt differently. So I think for me, this just highlights how important stories are in our relationships with each other and in our communities. Um, they also highlight to me that we are all storytellers, whether we realize it or not. I know that I tell stories in the things that I say and also in the things that I don't say. Um, I know that I especially tell stories in the things that I do and the things that I don't do as well. So for me, storytelling is as much about listening as it is about speaking up. Um, and I also just want to share that my sister <laughs> has a child now. And this is my niece. Um, she's just just turned one on April 1st of this year and her name's Naya and so my reason my you know reason for being a storyteller my why is I, I acknowledge that I am a storyteller and I do my best to to integrate values that are inclusive um, of a diverse community in the best way possible so that I can create a future or work to create a future where generations like my niece can live in a safer world um, a safer and healthier world. So with that, I also just wanna to share a few resources. Um, 
I will be hosting a workshop on the 27th of this month, um, 2 to 3.30 Eastern time, called Place-Based and Inclusive Storytelling. And this is actually a workshop that Lander and I co-developed um, together. And I'm converting it to an online version. <laughs> so I really hope that you can join me for that. We're going to dig into some difficult topics and really look at ourselves and what our stories uh, are capable of and how we can, can really reframe ours to create positive change. Um, you can book a place. There's limited spaces. So um, definitely, if you do want to join, book as soon as you can. The link is there at www.forestschools.podia.com. And anyone who's here today, you are welcome to access the discount code at 20% off. And that is we are all storytellers. So I hope you can join me for that. And I also um, want to share, as part of that workshop, I'm going to be sharing this a resource that, that Lander co-developed with a group of people. But I want to share it specifically with you all now. Um, and I'm going to put this, uh, I'm going to put this in the link in the comments too. But uh, this is a resource where we can start to reflect on the stories that we share and how we can um, work to make them more inclusive of our communities and the, the people around the world and those that we're directly interacting with. Because um, like I said today, stories, and all of us have said, stories are powerful. Um, so let's acknowledge that we're telling them and be more intentional about it. Mm -hmm. um, or I invite you to do that because that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So yeah. I know that's uh, that's speaking from the heart. That was full on speaking from the heart, and tears are even welling up in my eyes um, as I continue to talk right now. But huge gratitude as well for all of you for being here and for this group of people who have encouraged me to share this and to hold that safe space for me to be able to, to um, share this, yeah. and for everybody who's watching today and has been a part of this. Um, I really want to continue these these gatherings together. Um, in some form, and I put up a little survey in the comments <laughs> to see when people might want to continue these and what format they might want to take um, so we can see where to, to go forward with this as a community because it's I think we've built something really great. Mm. So anything else from anyone <laughs> before we end for the day? Yeah, let me put the link up. I thought of uh, another resource for people who are interested in getting into storytelling is just Googling or researching online if your communities have any storytelling groups or meetup hangouts, anything like that. So I realized I hadn't done that at all until right now. And it, it seems like the Calgary area does have a few different storyteller groups. So I'm thinking I will look into that a little bit further and then I can actually, once the pandemic situation is over and we can get out and about, I can join some of their meetups and talk with people locally about these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also want to say thank you everyone for tuning in. <laughs> Thanks Teague. Yeah. I'm just throwing in some links for people before we go. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just, cool. yeah, thank cool. you guys for providing this lovely little place to hang out on Wednesday afternoon. And it's been really interesting learning, um, hearing your stories this afternoon. I know that they were snapshots, really, but it's really nice to to know, you know more about more about each of you it's really cool and yeah i would love to be back again to do something in the future because it is it's a lovely little community and i think today it's felt much more inclusive as well i felt like i've been able to read some of the comments and respond a bit and um i think we're just getting a bit more natural at it or relaxed so yeah it's been great i'm just grateful that it didn't i didn't lose anybody in this. <laughs> But can I also, I'd also like to say as well, one thing um, that I've been working on this week, I mentioned We Be Kids earlier, but we've been working on making, We Be Kids originally was a subscription um, service, but we've been working on making it completely free to all users. So it, We Be Kids is now completely free for everybody to use. And that means that um, every week I upload one story that I tell. So if you're yeah. looking for new ideas for stories, then um, go to Weeby Kids and 
there's, there's about 15, 18 stories, I think, there at the moment, and I'll keep uploading them um, as I tell them. And there's also resources for nature connection and nature nature crafts and, and yoga and mindfulness as well. So please use that. We've tried to just give it away with kindness in the hope that people use it and it makes a difference. So it is there for you all. Wow. Great. Thank you, Danny. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, shall we end it there for today? Yay. Uh, yeah, again, a yeah. huge thank you to everybody who showed up today and for all of your questions and comments. I, you know, I recognize we didn't get to all the questions and <laughs> the discussion on, on all the different comments. And I think that's just telling that we need to continue this. <laughs> there needs to be more, more conversation. So please uh, fill out the survey if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can know how to how to take this forward. Uh, the link is in the comments. Um, I also hope to see some of you at the place-based and inclusive storytelling workshop. I'll throw the banner for that up um, one more time just before we log off. So that's going to be yeah on the 27th. And please feel free to access the the discount code. Um, I also offer a pay as you can and a scholarship um, uh, opportunity through that too. So um, if uh, yeah you need financial assistance, that's, it's there for you to, to join in. And other than that, I hope we all connect again soon and mm. continue to share our stories. <laughs> okay. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Thanks for Bye, everybody. Bye. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>